learn to speak English like a native. Join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Join my VIP program. Also get a discount on my pronunciation course. Welcome! Chapter 8 of our book club, Animal Farm. Chapter 8, the book title, Animal Farm. Chapter 8, and the author, the writer, George Orwell, of course. So, continuing on with Chapter 8. It's a little bit of a long chapter, so I'm going to start quickly and do my best to explain everything that happens in this chapter. So, let's just begin. So, Chapter 8. Remember, chapter 7 ended with mass executions. Mass meaning a, a large amount. And executions. Killing, right? Napoleon had lots and lots and lots of the animals murdered. Killed them. So, chapter 8 begins. A few days later, after the terror. Terror is extreme fear. After the terror caused by the executions had died down, meaning reduced gone down, gone down, decreased. Some of the animals remembered, or they thought they remembered, one of the rules. And one of the rules was, no animal shall kill another animal. Remember they have these rules. They called them commandments. Like they're commands, right? So in the, the Bible, there's the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Rules of God. So these are not just Little small rules, these are super, super serious rules, right? The, the, the commands, right? More powerful than just a normal rule. So, one of their commandments was, no animal shall kill any other animal. So, no killing of animals. This was one of the super strong rules of the revolution. And they just broke that rule, right? Napoleon just killed lots and lots of animals. But once again, the rules got changed. So first, um, Clover, one of the horses, asked Benjamin the donkey. Remember Benjamin? who's kind of the wise one. He's a smart one. He's, he sees, he's known from the beginning. He saw everything that was happening. And he's just very, he's smart. He just keeps quiet. <laughs> and uh, Clover asked Benjamin, can you please read the rules? Remember, they wrote the rules on the barn, on the side of the wall. So, Benjamin says, no, no, no thanks, I'm not going to read it. So, he won't do it. Because he's smart, and he knows what's happening. But, um, she finds someone else to do it, and the rule has been changed. Once again, the pigs have added something to the rule. The original rule was, no animal shall kill another animal. That's it. But then, they wrote a new phrase at the end of the rule, the pigs, without cause, without cause, or without reason. So it says, no animal shall kill any other animal without cause, without a reason. So once again, they change the rules. So instead of no killing, now it's no killing unless you have a good reason. And of course, this means now that Napoleon can kill anyone he wants to. That was, what it really means is if, if Napoleon feels like he needs to kill another animal, he can just do it, because he has a reason. And then the next phrase, again, this is kind of dark humor, where he's, uh, it says that, you know, the animals, once again, they thought they remembered the rule, but oh, obviously, no, this must be the real rule. Maybe they don't trust their own memory, right? They don't trust their own minds. They don't trust themselves. This is a key point that we see throughout Animal Farm, where the animals trust authority instead of trusting themselves. They trust the pigs. They trust the leaders instead of trusting their own memories, instead of trusting their own values, instead of trusting their own minds. Instead, they constantly look, look, look to the leaders, to Napoleon, to the pigs, to tell them what to do. And instead of trusting their own memories, once again, they trust what the pigs say. 
So they, they, instead of trusting their memories, they think, oh, maybe our memory's bad. No, this must be the rule. And on, and clearly, Napoleon had a good reason to kill those animals. Though they were bad animals, and Napoleon had a good reason to kill them. Good Lord, lots of noise around here right now. Sorry if you hear a siren. Really noisy outside my apartment right now. Then, um, as we already saw in chapter 7, chapter 8, the, the living conditions get even worse for the animals. Now they are working longer hours and getting no more food. So, their life, it's now very clear, it even says clearly, their life is worse than with Mr. Jones. So, life is now worse than before the revolution. So, no, the revolution made their life worse, ultimately. Finally, their life is actually much worse than before. <laughs> they were better under the human. But it says that the animals really cannot remember very clearly before the revolution, right? It's now getting farther into the, into the past, and so they don't really remember what was life like before the revolution, right? So they, they don't remember if it, life was worse or life was better. But of course, the pigs with the propaganda they and Napoleon, they keep saying, oh, life is much better now. Your life is better now. Your life is better now. Those terrible humans. And so they kind of believe the propaganda and they're forgetting. They're forgetting what their life was like before. And of course, as the the youth, the younger animals grow up, they, they were not alive before the revolution. So they don't even know what happened before. So they completely believe the lies, the propaganda. Now, also, another thing continues from chapter 7, where Napoleon becomes more and more isolated, right? He's, he's becoming more and more separate from all the other animals. He has his own room in the farmhouse now, and he kind of disappears. He doesn't really uh, talk to the other animals. He's just off by himself with his dogs, of course, right? Now, next we have something, again, this is something we see in a lot of uh, dictatorships, where uh, they, don't, they stop calling him just Napoleon. He starts to get a lot of titles, really big titles that sound incredible. They, they're constantly giving him new titles. So they call him our leader, Comrade Napoleon, the father of all animals, the terror of mankind, right? Like the enemy of mankind, the protector of sheep. The friend of the ducks, you know, and on and on and on, right? So they're giving him all these incredible, great titles that sound amazing. So again, building him up as this superhero, really. And they constantly, with the propaganda, they're talking about how wonderful Napoleon. He's perfect. He, he's wise. His heart is so good. He loves animals everywhere so much. So, you know, he's, he's super strong. He's perfectly smart. He's super kind. Everything about Napoleon is perfect. We'll talk more about this because this is a, a very common thing that we see in dictatorships. It's called a cult of personality. A cult is a kind of uh, religion, but not like like a religion that's not true, kind of a brainwash religion, a propaganda religion. So a cult of personality, personality meaning one person, right? So we've seen this in, uh, well, in, in almost every dictatorship, right? Eventually they make the dictator, they try to make him into almost a god, Right? It's almost like the old Egyptian pharaohs, right? That they're not just humans, they're almost like gods. They're, everything about them is perfect. Right? So in North Korea they do this, right? With the, the they call him dear leader. He's not just the president or something, he's the dear leader. And everything about him is perfect. He's intelligent. He can he's they say he's good looking, even though he's not. Um, they they're constantly going on and on and on about how wonderful he is. Everything he does is wonderful, right? The perfect leader, the perfect human, the superhero, the like a semi god, almost a god. And they say, Napoleon, every time something good happens, they say it was because of Napoleon. Even just something that's good luck, they say, oh, it's because of Napoleon. Right? So everything good, it's because of Napoleon. 
And then they make a big portrait. One of the pigs uh, paints, makes a picture of Napoleon, a really big one. And they put it on the, oh, on another wall of the barn. So this is, again, something you see with these dictatorships, cults of personality, right? Where they, the, they put the picture of the leader everywhere, these huge pictures of the great leader, oh, right? And they, they're all over, you know, on the streets. They, they do them on television, they do them in the movies, it's everywhere, right? So the, the pigs do this with Napoleon. Then there are more killings. They continue to kill more animals. Three chickens confess. They say, oh yes, I am working with Snowball. And then Napoleon kills them. And we're not sure if the, here, do the chickens say that, really say this? Or does Napoleon and the pigs say this, right? So this is where, are they really confessing? Are they really doing these crimes? Or is Napoleon and are the pigs, um, lying and saying they did the crimes, but really they didn't. So again, they're killed. They're executed. And ah, and then the, here we get what's called paranoia, the, the super suspicion. Because one problem with, the, uh, with these kind of leaders is they start to become scared. They start becoming scared that someone will take over. Someone will kill them. Someone will get rid of them. Someone will take their position because this is common, right? These guys, they use these, these uh, strategies, these methods to gain power, but then they become afraid because they realize someone else could use the same methods and take their power. So now Napoleon is becoming scared. He's becoming paranoid of losing his power. So at night, he sleeps with the dogs by his bed. The dogs are guarding him always. And they find a new, a young pig to taste his food. He's afraid to be poisoned. So another pig has to first taste his food to check for poison. So now Napoleon's becoming more scared of losing his power. Then there start to be rumors of an attack. So there are two different farms, remember, next to Animal Farm. And so Napoleon and the pigs start making propaganda. There's an attack coming, an attack coming. And first they say it's one... Uh, a farmer named Frederick. That he, Frederick is their enemy, one of the neighbors. And Frederick is going to attack them. And Frederick is super evil. And Frederick is torturing and killing and doing bad things to his animals. And he's a horrible, horrible person. Frederick, Frederick, Frederick. You know, so another outside enemy. And of course, Snowball is working with Frederick. Snowball is working with this evil human. And then he says, death to Frederick, right? New propaganda. So Frederick, suddenly they choose a new outside enemy, Frederick, one of the neighbor farms. And they say, oh yeah, death to Frederick. And Snowball is working with him. Of course, it's a complete lie. Snowball's gone. And then, of course, they change the history even more. They rewrite or they, re they change the history again. Now they say Snowball never was a hero. That at the battle... He ran away. He was a coward. He was afraid. And again, some of the animals remember, no, no, I, re I remember. I was there. Snowball fought really hard. He was a hero. But then, again, the propaganda constantly, the lies again and again and again and again, they start to believe it and then they finally believe the propaganda and they don't trust their own memories. Then finally, a big event, they finish the windmill a second time, this time with bigger walls. So they finish the windmill again after two years of working. Yeah, they do it. Finally, again, they finish the windmill. And they name it the Napoleon Windmill, of course. They name, they name it after Napoleon. Now next, this is kind of an interesting part. It's a little confusing. But... They, Napoleon is trying to do business with the two farms. There's two farmers, Frederick and Pilkington. Frederick and Pilkington. These are two human farmers. And Napoleon is trying to sell some wood. Right? The, the, they need some money. The animals need money so they can buy 
equipment, machines for the windmill. So the windmill's finished, but they need some machines. They have to buy a few more machines so the windmill will work. And they don't have the machines, so how, how can they do it? Well, the plan is they have some extra wood, and they're going to sell the wood to one of these two farms. And what happens is that Napoleon, he tries to, uh, he's trying to kind of negotiate and, and really to cheat these farmers. So first he decides he's going to sell to, um, Pilking, uh, to Pilkington, right? He's going to, he's decided, I'm going to sell the wood to Pilkington. So then they make Frederick the enemy. Frederick's evil, blah, 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 blah. But then he suddenly changes his mind. He gets a better deal from Frederick. So when that happens, they change the propaganda completely, very fast, and they, they say, no, no, Frederick's okay, actually, it's no problem. Uh, this was just a trick, this was just a plan of Napoleon's. And actually, Pilkington is the evil guy. Pilkington is the evil human. So they're saying he tricked Frederick because by pretending to be friends with the other guy, he made one farmer raise his price. So Napoleon's trying to trick him, right? He, he's First he's friends with one human, one farmer, and then the other farmer raises the price for the wood, offers more money, and then Napoleon changes and says, okay, now I'll sell to you, I'm your friend, trying to get the other guy to raise his price. So he's kind of cheating both of these human farmers, trying to cheat them and get a high price from one of them. And finally, he sells to Frederick, and he gets money, five pound notes, meaning the British pound, the money, the pound, like the US dollar, the British pound. Remember, this is in Britain. But after he sells the wood, they find out that the banknotes, the money, is fake. It's not real money. So Frederick cheated him. Right? So he tried to cheat Frederick and kind of negotiate and get a better price, but Napoleon was fooled. Napoleon was tricked. He got fake money. I call this a, a forgery. A forgery is a fake. So it's fake money. So Napoleon's really upset, and he says, death to Frederick. He says, we're going to kill Frederick. But then they find out Frederick decides, not only does he trick Napoleon, but Frederick also decides to attack Napoleon. So Frederick tricked him, gave him fake money, took the wood, and then 15 of Frederick's men, they attack Animal Farm. So another battle. But this time, it's a much more difficult battle, because Frederick and his men, they're more prepared, they're more ready. They bring guns, they bring half a dozen guns, meaning six guns. And they start shooting at the animals immediately. And several animals are wounded, hurt, and several animals are killed, and they all run away, and they hide. They hide in the farm buildings. So the humans win the beginning of the battle. And the humans take control of the windmill. And then something terrible happens. They... Benjamin sees what they're doing and he says, oh no, they're going to blow up. They're going to destroy the windmill. Right? They've just been working two more years to build it again. And what happens? <laughs> the humans blow up. They destroy the windmill. All that terrible hard work through the winter and the starving and the not enough food and the uh, all that horrible work. And the humans, Frederick's men, blow it up. They destroy the windmill. So the windmill destroyed a second time. This time by the humans from Frederick's farm. And when the animals see it blow up, they're so upset because they work for two years, right? They're so upset that they, they, they scream and they go crazy and they attack. And they attack and they're just full of anger. Ah! And they attack the humans again. And there's, there's a huge, terrible fight back and forth, back and forth. And a lot of animals die. A cow, three sheep, and two geese are killed. Almost everyone is wounded. Even Napoleon, who's at the back, of course, gets a small wound, a little bullet, uh, hits his tail. And 
This time, finally, the animals win the second battle. Right, but it's but it's but but they lose a lot. Right, the windmills destroyed. Uh, a lot of them are killed, and most of them are hurt. So this battle is not so great for them. They 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 do win in the end, but they lose a lot. So it's not a very good victory for them this time. They're super tired. They're bleeding. The the windmill it says is completely destroyed. <coughs> they exploded it. It's all gone. Even the rocks that they remember they had to break the rocks. The rocks were <laughs> exploded and they go really far. Some of the rocks go outside the farm, so they're completely gone. So it's just it's a really big disaster for them. And then Squealer says, yay, it's time to celebrate. Remember, Squealer's the assistant to Napoleon. Celebrate our great victory, yay! But none of them really feel very happy. Even Boxer says, what victory? What victory? Right? It doesn't feel like a victory because they lost all the work from the, uh, on the windmill. The windmill's destroyed. They, they, many of them were dead. So, again, the pigs are trying to make the propaganda. Yay, we... We won, but the animals feel terrible. The other animals feel terrible. And then Squealer says, Oh, don't worry. We will build another windmill. But of course, it's not we. The pigs don't help. So the pigs are just going to force them to do it again. So of course, the animals are not very happy because they have to do the work. But the pigs don't care because they're not actually building. They don't have to do it. Boxer's uh, hurt. His leg is hurting. It's really painful. He got hurt. And this time, Boxer's getting start for the first time. Boxer has a little bit of change in his thinking, and he realizes that he's eleven years old, which I guess is old for a horse. And he realizes that maybe he's not as strong as he used to be. And so when he thinks about building the windmill again the third time, he get, he's a little worried this time. You know, Before he just said, I will work harder, I will work harder. But now there's a little bit of change in him because he's starting to feel like, oh, maybe, maybe I can't do it anymore. I'm getting older and all this terrible hard work is making me weaker. And he's not so optimistic anymore. They have a funeral. They bury the dead animals. Um, <laughs> they Who gets a, an award for this battle? Remember, Snowball got the award at the first battle. But of course, who do they give an award to? They make a new award called the Green Banner, oh, the Order of the Green Banner. And of course, Napoleon gives it to himself. So even though Napoleon was mo in the back, he got a small injury, but he really didn't do much. Uh, he certainly didn't do any of the fighting, but they, he gets the award and he gives it to himself. So they, he makes himself the big hero of the second battle, the Battle of the Windmill. Not a surprise. And then finally, there's a little bit of, again, humor, dark humor, black humor. Uh, the pigs find some whiskey, some alcohol in the bottom of the farmhouse, underneath the farmhouse. And they all get drunk. <laughs> so they have a celebration. We won the battle! Yay! <coughs> Excuse me. The other animals, not so excited. But the pigs are excited because they don't care. They don't have to do the work. So they, the pigs are excited because they're, they kept their power. They still have their power, right? They're still the leaders. The humans did not take over Animal Farm. So for the pigs, it's a great victory. For the animals, it's, a, it's not a great victory. Many of them died. No pigs died. And they got to do all the terrible work again for the windmill. The pigs don't. So the pigs are happy. The pigs are super excited. They're still on top. And the battle was won. And so they all get drunk. And then this is the, the dark humor. Uh, Squealer, the next day they're all hung over and they feel terrible. But remember, this is the first time they drank alcohol. So they really don't understand it. So they, Napoleon, it's not, they, he doesn't say it directly, but basically Squealer says, I have terrible news. Napoleon is dying. Napoleon is dying. And all the animals, oh no, they start crying. Napoleon's dying. 
but he's not really dying. He just feels like he's dying because he probably has a headache. He's hung over, right? But it's his first time to be hung over, so they all think he's dying, he's dying. He's probably, uh, right? So this is a little bit of a joke from Orwell. And then Napoleon makes a rule while he's hung over, feeling terrible the first day. Um, if any animal drinks alcohol, they will be punished by death. So death for drinking alcohol. If you drink alcohol, you will be killed. Death, right? So he's, again, he's regretting the drinking of alcohol. He's seeing that it's terrible. Oh, he thinks it's killing him. But here's the joke. Then, uh, however, by the evening, Napoleon was feeling better. And by the next day, he was feeling fine, totally normal again, back at to work. And then they learned that uh, the pigs bought some books about how to brew and make alcohol. <laughs> so Napoleon completely changes his mind when Napoleon and the pigs realize they're not dying. It's just a hangover. It's temporary. It's just short time. Then they completely change their mind again. No death for alcohol. Suddenly they want to make their own alcohol. So they, they find a little part of the field, a little area of the farm to grow barley. That's for making beer. And uh, they, they, they start drinking again. And then um, our chapter is going to end again with a little bit of dark humor. Uh, at midnight, one, no one night, the animals hear a big crash. And they go to see what's happening. And they find Squealer. He's, he's on the ground and there's a ladder next to him, broken ladder. And he's next to the barn. And there's some paint and a paintbrush on the ground. And they're all confused. The animals don't understand what's happening. They're, oh, they're looking around. They don't know. The dogs come. They take Squealer. They take him back to his bed. Uh, but then... Um, when the animals look up, they see there's kind of fresh paint for the rules, right? So again, Squealer was changing the rules. And the original rule was, no animal shall drink alcohol. That was rule number five, commandment number five. But now, he added to excess, meaning too much. So, the new rule is, no animal shall drink alcohol to excess. This means, no animal shall drink alcohol too much. So again, they change the rule. They, so now instead of no alcohol, it's, oh, you can't drink too much. So again, this is the constant changing of history, the constant changing of the rules. And that is the end of chapter 8. Let's go back to the beginning. And we'll talk about the meaning. A lot of the meaning, a lot of the ideas really are continued from chapter 7, chapter 6, the earlier parts of the story. So really in chapter 8, I th what we're seeing is really everything becoming a continuation. And there's a little more of this dark or black humor in chapter 8 where, um, you know, especially because the story, this is, the, this is what makes Animal Farm different than 1984. Orwell's two famous books, that is this kind of humor. By using animals and by, uh, by showing us the very obvious propaganda techniques, right? They're really obvious to us as we read these. It's so obvious what's happening. And so we can kind of laugh at the animals being so foolish. We can laugh at the animals being stupid. We kind of can laugh at how the pigs are constantly changing the rules and how Napoleon constantly changes the rules for his benefit, his own benefit, right? Anytime Napoleon wants to do something, he changes the rules so that he can do whatever he wants. And so, yeah, there, that's... A kind of, it's kind of, a, like I said, a black humor. So it's, it's, it's funny, but in a kind of a sad way, <laughs> right? It's, it's, a, it's a black or a, a... Black meaning not... It's not like light and wonderful. It's a little bit... There's kind of a darkness to it. But it is still funny. Because it's so exaggerated. So let's go back. Let's just discuss some of the ideas again uh, in chapter 8. So again, we see the constant changing of the rules. So in the, the, in the beginning of the chapter, no animal shall kill another animal. They change that to no animal shall kill another animal without cause. Right? So it's really easy. They just change the rule a little bit. Oh, and suddenly, now the, the rulers, 
the, the powerful can do anything they want. And this is something we've seen um, in, all, in all forms of government, really. Uh, and the more powerful they become, the more they, the people at the top can just change the rules anytime they want, right? So there's, and often we see there's one kind of rule for the people at the top, and then one kind of rule for everybody else. So if the normal animals kill another animal, ooh, not good, bad, they will, they'll kill them or do something bad, they'll punish them. But if Napoleon kills lots and lots of the animals, oh, no problem, he can do that, because he has a reason. Right? So we see this again and again. It's the same with the other animal, um, the other rule about alcohol, where the rule is changed simply because Napoleon wants to change the rule, simply to benefit Napoleon and the pigs. So everything, all the rules now, instead of trying to benefit all the animals, now all the rules are changed to just benefit the pigs, and especially Napoleon. And, of course, you know, there's the killing again. The killing is used to cause fear, to make all the animals afraid so that they don't challenge the pigs, so they don't challenge Napoleon, right? That's why they do these occasionally, like he kills some more chickens, and they say, oh, the chickens confessed to a crime, right? So it's just to make everyone afraid. The constant fear techniques, this is what Orwell really describes so well. The, the techniques of fear and control. And it's done in two ways. It's the ex external enemies, right? The external enemies, like Snowball, or one of the human farmers, or all the humans. And then the internal enemies, right? The people who are thinking bad thoughts against Napoleon. And everybody worried about everybody else being a spy. So it's creating this constant fear so that no one will challenge Napoleon, no one will challenge the pigs. And of course, Napoleon becomes more and more separate. We also see that, of course, the way that rulers keep themselves separate from the people, right? They, they live in their nice, big, expensive houses. They, they're surrounded by bodyguards, right? Normal people can't get close to the leaders, and we see this everywhere, right? This is true of the, the President of the United States. It's true of... Um, you know, in North Korea, it's true everywhere, really, where these leaders become, you know, they're above everybody else and separate from everybody else, and normal people can't even contact them anymore. Another little bit of dark humor, but it's so true, is in the use of all these titles, right? Where the dictator gets all these great, incredibly huge titles, right? Where he's, he's a great general, and he's a great thinker, and he's a philosopher, and he's a scientist, and he's, a, he's an artist, and he's a musician, and he he's, has such a good, kind heart, but he's also strong, right? It's a, uh, building him up as the Superman, the, the, we call it demi-god. Demi, meaning almost or partly. So he's not a full god, because he does die, and he's human, but he's godlike. He's like a god. He's building this leader up to be like a god. He's perfect. He's the perfect human. Or in this case, Napoleon is the perfect animal. And all these titles, we've seen this in history, where they get these more and more and more titles. Or you always see the dictators, you know, when they wear, sometimes they have a military uniform, and they have all the medals, right? even though they never really fought or did anything, but they've got medals and medals as all in their uniform, full of medals, <laughs> even though they never were in a battle <laughs> or they never did anything. But they, again, they're, they're like the super warrior, right? It's just this whole propaganda image to get the people. It's like, a, again, kind of a fake religion. Get the people to worship oh, this person as almost like a god. And, you know, of course, they say everything Napoleon does is great. And then the pictures of Napoleon now, they start putting the big pictures of him. So, again, creating him as the demigod. And, again, the, the phrase for this is cult of personality. C-U-L-T. Cult of personality. That's what we call this. And we even see this with celebrity. On a smaller, a smaller version of this, and, a, and maybe a little less scary version because they have less power. But it's the same idea as celebrities, you know, with, you know, actors, musicians, where you see their fans almost worship them. Ah, 
ah, ah, screaming for them and ah, ah, you know, uh, like they're, again, like they're some kind of uh, superhumans or something. Right? And it's, a, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's a kind of propaganda. Uh, it's a cult of personality. A cult meaning a kind of fake religion. We see he's getting more scared now, Napoleon, so he's got more and more guards. Now, this is, again, something else we saw. We certainly saw, you know, with Stalin, who Napoleon kind of represents Stalin, but he, he represents any dictator, really. Um, and what we usually see is, because, if you think about it, because these dictators, they're so evil and terrible, and they take power and they use all these terrible techniques to do it, well, the problem is they, also, they become terrified. Once they have the power, they become very scared because they start to worry someone else will do the same thing to them, right? So they realize, well, I did this. I used these techniques and I got the power. Well, what if someone does it to me? And that's when they become paranoid. They become scared of everybody. They become scared of losing their power. Because they know they're evil. They're doing all these evil things. And they become terrified. What if, what if the animals stop believing the propaganda? What if the animals realize the truth about Napoleon? Maybe they'll decide to get rid of him and kill him. I mean, we have seen this, right? We've seen it in history where a dictator, the people overthrow the dictator. What do they do? They're not nice to him, right? When they, when the, if the people do finally wake up... They, they kill him, usually, right? They hang him, like, you know, Mussolini was hung. Um, they shoot him. They do, they do t lots of terrible stuff. So, the dictators you will see, often they, they also ha they have a, this great power, but they also have a, a great amount of fear of losing that power. They fear that what they're doing these terrible things, they fear someone will do them to them. They fear there will be another revolution, and this time they will be punished. And so this is why the secret police, this is why Napoleon sleeps with the dogs at all times. This is why he, he worries about being poisoned. And we've seen this in, um, again, in these dictatorships, these kind of uh, uh, governments control that they become more and more paranoid. So more and more secret police, more and more regular police. They start to spy on their own citizens, on their own people. They become more and more afraid of their own people. And this is happening with Napoleon. Right. Okay, again, the thing with Snowball where they say, he, no, no, he never was a hero. He was a coward. He did nothing in the first battle. This is just more of the rewriting of history. And you can see it's gradual, right? First, the Snowball was a great hero. He got an award. Then when they got rid of Snowball, then they said, oh, Snowball was maybe a little bit of a hero, but Napoleon was the true hero, right? And then they say, oh, Snowball didn't really get an award. And now they're saying Snowball actually was a coward and he did nothing, right? So step by step, they changed the history completely from the truth, Snowball was a big hero, to the complete lie, the opposite of the truth, Snowball was an enemy and a coward. And because they do it gradually like this, the animals accept it. They accept the lies instead of trusting their own memories and trusting the truth. Now, there's another phrase that we... This is a common technique, by the way. And there's a slang phrase in English for this that we use. It's called boiling a frog. That sounds terrible. <laughs> boiling a frog, right? But this is the technique. Boiling a frog or boiling the frog. And you'll, you'll see this sometimes. You'll see this in newspapers or uh, people will discuss this technique. Boiling a frog or boiling the frog. What does it mean? Well, it comes from this uh, story. I don't know if it's true, but supposedly this is just one of those stories we hear all the time. But Supposedly, the idea is this. If you have a frog and you put him in warm water, right? You just put him in warm water. And then gradually, very, 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 very slowly, you increase the heat, right? You start to heat the water. But not suddenly fast. Very, very slowly. I don't know if this is true, but people say 
is the story is that if you put the frog in the hot water very quickly, the frog will jump out, right? The frog will say, oh, it's hot! And the frog will jump out and escape the hot water. But if you put him in the warm water and increase the heat very, very, very slowly, super slowly, the idea is the frog will never notice. And eventually, the water will boil and the frog will die. And he'll never jump out. Is this true? I don't know. I don't know if it's true, but the story is important. It's the meaning of the story that's important, right? What is the meaning of this story about the frog and boiling it? The meaning is this. A sudden change, people will notice immediately. Huh? What? Right? If they suddenly, very quickly just said, Snowball was... Snowball was a coward. He did nothing at the battle. If they suddenly did this, if they did it immediately, all the animals would remember, no, 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 it's too far from the truth. The lie is too big. And the animals would probably not accept it. So what do they do instead? What's the technique? Instead, the technique is to do lots of small little lies very gradually, changing history very slowly, or using a technique very slowly, or telling the lies slowly, and then a little more, and then a little more, and a little more. Boiling the frog, right? Step by step, each change is so small that the animals will not fight back. The animals will not argue against it. They'll accept it because it seems small. But then what happens? Well, then the next month, another small change, and then another small change. But every individual change is so small, each lie is so small, the animals will never fight them until eventually they are boiled, right? Until eventually they are killed or totally controlled. And this is a technique absolutely that is used. Well, we've seen this with lots of social changes. I can see this in my own country where, you know, they, if I look back 50 years, uh, they didn't immediately start to say, oh, yes, you know, uh, any man who thinks he's a woman is really a woman, right? Because 50 years ago, people would have said, well, that's crazy, no way. They would never have accepted that. So they had to make this change as gradually, gradually over, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, little by little, little by little, until finally a lot of people will accept this big lie. So it's this very technique. So this is why you must be careful of this, because this is a super common technique. Very common technique used by all kinds of governments, uh, not just dictators, by all kinds of governments, uh, and not only governments, by social movements, by lots of different groups, to create some really huge changes, but they just do it gradually. It's sort of the negative version of Kaizen. Right? It's, the, it's the negative version, or the dishonest, the not honest version of small, tiny improvements over time. So instead of small, tiny improvements, which is a good thing, we get small, tiny lies that build and build and build until they become huge lies. So boiling the frog is the slang phrase. Boiling the frog. You could say it's like boiling a frog. Okay, the windmill gets finished. Now, the next thing is where you see the battle that happens with the humans. But this battle, um, this battle, this, this battle, the second battle, is really caused by Napoleon. It's really his fault because he's trying to cheat the humans. So he, he, he keeps, he's, he's got the two human farmers. He's trying to get more money. So first he says one's an enemy and he says lots of bad things about them and constant bad propaganda about one. Then he changes to the other one and says bad propaganda about them. And so he makes these, both these human farmers really angry at him. Right? So they don't trust him. They're angry at him. And then finally one of them, Frederick, cheats him and then attacks him. And I, I forgot to mention that during the attack, Napoleon asks for help. He asks the other farmer for help, but the other farmer says, no, you deserve it. You deserve it. You tried to cheat me. So the other farmer won't help him. So the animals don't know this, because of course Napoleon is always lying. But the truth is that Napoleon causes this battle, because he was constantly verbally attacking 
both saying bad things about both farmers, making both of the other human farmers, the neighbors, very, very angry and trying to cheat them. So, really, he caused the battle. It's his fault. But, of course, the propaganda, what he tells the animals is that, oh, no, 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 it's just those evil humans. That's all. They're just evil. And they lose the battle this time uh, in the beginning. And eventually they win, but it's, it's a very, very tough battle. And uh, I'll, get, I'll see, teach you another uh, nice phrase. It's called a Phyric Victory. Phyric. Pyrrhic, P-H-Y-R-R-I-C, I believe is the spelling. Pyrrhic or Pyrrhic, is it Pyrrhic or Pyrrhic? Pyrrhic, Pyrrhic, Pyrrhic. I think it's a Pyrrhic victory. I, I'm not even sure about the pronunciation. I'm supposed to be an English teacher. My gosh, I can't believe it. Let's look it up right now. I'm going to give you the correct pronunciation. One second, Pyrrhic victory. Pyrrhic victory. And then I'll tell you the meaning. So you gotta wait a second. Be patient. Oh, come on. Pyrrhic victory. Patience, patience, one second. I'm looking it up. Pronunciation, how do we pronounce it? Okay, here's a dictionary. Mir Miriam Webster, that should do that should work. Where's the pronunciation? Come on. Pyrrhic. Pyrrhic! Ha <laughs> ha! Not an F sound, it's a P sound. Pyrrhic. Pyrrhic. Pyrrhic with the P. Pyrrhic victory. Okay, now I'll tell you the meaning. A Pyrrhic victory is a victory that is not really a victory. So in other words, you, 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 technically you win. You win the battle, but you lose the war. This is the idea of a Pyrrhic victory. And it comes from a Roman general who... Was it Roman or Greek? See, ah, oh, my goodness. I believe Roman. Maybe it was Greek, though. Ah, uh, anyway. <laughs> Roman or a Greek general who, um, uh, I believe it was Roman. I was just going to go with Roman. A Roman who, he won several battles, but he lost the war. Because each time he won a battle, he would lose so many men, so many of his men would get killed that he actually got weaker. So each time he won, he got weaker until finally he lost the war. This is called a Pyrrhic victory. So the animals have a kind of Pyrrhic victory, right? They, they, they win the battle, but they lose so many animals and they lose the windmill that in a way the animals, and for the long term, they really, they lose, right? In the short term they win, but in the long term they lose. A Pyrrhic victory, a Pyrrhic victory. And, of course, they want to have a celebration, but there's nothing to celebrate. And we finally see the very first change in Boxer. But, you know, not much. He kind Sadly, you know, Boxer doesn't completely wake up. And it's really, it's much too late for Boxer. It's much too late for the uh, animals. And he, he wakes up a little bit. He's starting to have just the first thoughts, the first realization that maybe something is truly wrong. But he can't quite totally admit it. He can't quite totally see it. This is kind of the tragedy of Boxer. And of course, again, Boxer represents really the, the normal person, the common, good-hearted person. And this is the tragedy of the common, good-hearted person. They trust the leaders too much. They trust the authority too much. They trust the propaganda too much. They trust the media too much. This is the tragedy of the normal good people. They're good people, but they trust too much. And this is why we've seen in history where these places where these terrible evil things have happened, where millions have been murdered and killed by the government. And these, these governments have been 
supported by good normal people. And yet, these good normal people join and participate and support the most horrible, terrible things. It's quite a tragedy. That's the, I think, one, you know, one of the central, one of the main tragedies of Animal Farm. And one of the main tragedies of modern American history, I mean American, uh, American too, but uh, world history, I should say. Uh, it really is one of the great tragedies. All right. Going forward. Oh, and then a little bit of comedy with, really the last thing with the alcohol is just sort of comedy, really, right? The pigs get drunk. They, Napoleon says, no alcohol. And then he realizes after he starts to feel better, oh, it's just a hangover. Okay, alcohol's okay now. <laughs> Let's have more, <laughs> right? So again, you're seeing how, again, the, the elite, the top, they get all these things. The pigs get things that the others don't get. Right? So we've seen this again, that the elite, the powerful, oh, they get all the great stuff. They get the best food. Even if everyone else is starving, they're never starving. They get the best luxury, the best food. Everything's great for them. And this is something we've seen in history, of course, again and again. And that's that. So, there you go. All right, I'll take a few comments or questions from Facebook, and then we're going to end our Effortless English show for today. That was Chapter 8. Woo! Two more chapters, Chapter 9 and Chapter 10. We are almost done with our very first book. Our very first Effortless English Book Club is almost finished. Yay! All right, so... Oh, one, one more comment. Um... After we do this, after we finish Animal Farm, we'll need to choose another book. And I'm almost certain we're doing Old Man in the Sea next. Ernest Hemingway. But what you might want to do first, I'm going to give you a small break. We're going to take a break. Maybe, I don't know, one or two weeks. Because what I would like you to do is to watch all the videos that I did. All the book club videos. Chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Watch them all. Then I would like you to try to read Animal Farm yourself. Try to read the book yourself in English. See if you can do it. Just try. Do your best. If you want to, you could also get the audiobook of Animal Farm. Because now, at, you know, in, in two more weeks, you will know the whole story. You could listen to my videos a few times so you really know the story. Then go and try to read it yourself in English. And then get the audiobook and listen to Animal Farm, each chapter, in English. Because there's a lot of good vocabulary in this book. You know the whole story, almost. But there's lots of good vocabulary in there. All right. Sane asks, Rusili says, um, this is Facebook Live, with questions. Uh, the, the dictionary definition of propaganda says that it's information spread in order to promote a particular goal. So, information to push a goal. That is the basic definition. However, all words, I don't know, all, most words, probably all words, have a kind of, um, it's called a connotation is the, the actual word, but it's kind of like the flavor of the word. It's the flavor, maybe the emotional flavor of the word. So in, propaganda has a negative flavor in English, okay? So it's not just information for a goal. It usually has the idea of lies, that it's not completely truthful, and that it also has the idea that the goal is not very good, that it's kind of a negative goal, right? So, um, so for example, advertising is different than propaganda. 
Now, some advertising is not, also not very positive, right? But, um, but advertising is really just to, it's to sell a product, which it's not such a, I don't know, it's usually not so evil. Depends on the product. But um, generally, you know, if someone trying to sell you a car, it doesn't have the feeling of, of like a, of a bad goal. And propaganda in English does. It has this idea of, usually it's a political Okay, so that's the other thing about propaganda. Usually it's something political, the goal is political, and, the, and it has this feeling of it's being, it's a, maybe a negative goal, and that the information is li our lies. The information is our lies. So, that's the full feeling of the word and how it's used in English. Okay, I'm going to end our recording for... The Effortless English Show now. I'm going to stay live on Facebook a few more minutes, answer some questions and comments. I hope you have enjoyed this Effortless English Show. Chapter 8 of Animal Farm. Next week, Chapter 9, we are almost finished with this book. Again, I encourage you, get the book. Ebook, paperback, anything you want. Get the book, Animal Farm by George Orwell. And try to read it yourself. Go slowly. Take your time. Don't need to be perfect, don't need to understand everything, but do your best to read the book yourself. All right, I will see you next week. As always, go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. See you next week.